We had a great week this week. I don't know what your week was like. Man, we had a fantastic week. It's the first time we've sat on the beach for four consecutive days. And uh, it, was, it was just, you know, which brings me up to another topic. We're moving to the beach. Um, we want you all to come too. No, it's just a joke. Nobody laughed. Wow. It's like people are going, yeah. <laughs> no, it was, it was so nice. I know some of you have done that, and you do it on a regular basis, but it, it was so good. We had, a, we had a great minister's retreat with uh, 60 pastors and wives, and uh, they taught us in the morning some great things and then released us in the afternoon just to go bum around. And it, it was just fantastic. And don't you think that Nina deserved that? I think that she really did. Yeah, I do too. I agree. Nina really deserved that. But anyway, we were sitting on the beach, and Nina, you know, she's so observant, and we're not doing anything. And there's this little white butterfly, and the butterfly is going like this around, you know? And she goes, Butterflies never fly straight. They don't know what they're doing. They just, have you ever noticed that? They just, butterflies just go around like that. And me being kind of the cliff, from Cheers that I am, you know, and I know something about everything. I thought, well, it's a good teaching moment. I might as well teach her something about butterflies and all that I know about about this. And I said, well, honey, it's it's real simple because butterflies have the brain about you know, could fit on a head of a pin. It's just so small, and they can only have one thought process at a time. You know, you you, you can take this and use this if you want it. And so it's flap, 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 steer flap, 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 steer, where we're like, you know, flap, steer, flap, steer, flap, steer, butterflies, just one thought at a time. So they're, you know, move. It's just really simple, right? Where we are so complex and we have thousands of things going on in our brains at one time. Some of you have got some things going on right now. You're already gone. But, it, you know, you, you know it's got, got all kinds of stuff going on right now. We've got thousands of things going on at one time. And, you know, endless stuff, and we're great at multitasking. As a matter of fact, anymore, if we're not multitasking, we, we get bored. But the thing is, is that we get, or let's say I, I get easily distracted. It doesn't take much to take me off course and to take me someplace else, you know. So it's kind of like the child that's chasing the butterfly. If you've ever seen a two- or three-year-old going after a butterfly, they'll just follow the butterfly forever, wherever the butterfly, you know, flap, flap, steer, flap, flap, steer. The child is behind the butterfly, just go anywhere the butterfly goes, trying to catch the butterfly. And that's kind of the way that I am, and I think some of you probably identify with this well, too, that you're easily distracted, and you want to do something, and yet somebody says something, or something else happens, and, and uh, you know, we got so much going on up here that, you know, we just easily go that way. And, you know, when it comes to our faith, most of us have had these, I'm sure all of us have had this experience at some time or the other where you go, okay, I'm completely sold out to Jesus, 100%. Uh, this is it. Uh, you know, the lights come on, and all of a sudden now I am completely sold out, and I can't believe that I was doing what I was doing, or, you know, my life was so aimless. But today now, uh, now this I've got it, and I'm just completely sold out to him. And no more playing around for me, and, you know, it, you think of the scriptures like uh, Moses' top ten list where he says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. No other, you know, just one God, really important. And then Jesus says, you know, you're supposed to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your strength, all your might. You know, you've got to do it with everything that you are. And so you're going to be just, just one-minded, just going one direction, you know, and 100%. And then usually when we get to those kind of moments and happens in our lives, we'll either make a mental list or we'll make a physical list, and we'll go through and say, well, he's, these are the things that have been distracting me, and I'm going to get back on track. And so, you know, the TV shows that I've been watching or the Internet places I've been going or, you know, my poker nights or, or whatever your thing is that you think has been taking you off or, you know. And then we'll put down some positive things. We'll say, well, you know, I'm gonna, I've got to pray more. I've got to study the Bible more. I've got to get in group. I've got to do these different things. I've got to, you know, start listening to more Christian music maybe. And we, we do all this stuff. And then, you know, we're really successful for a while. It, it goes great, you know, for a while. It goes, it goes really, and, you know, we're content. But then we get distracted again. 
And, you know, I, I think of this, this scene, you all, you all seen this scene, uh, the jerk, the jerk, the scene in the jerk, you know, where uh, his life has been, do we get it? Yeah. His life has been great, and then he makes those glasses, and they got the thing in the middle, and he makes millions of dollars, and yet the thing in the middle makes people go cross-eyed, so he loses his fortune, and, and he has to leave the mansion, and he decides that he's going to go, and you've seen this, you remember the scene, he says, I don't need any of this, right? He says, I don't need anything but this ashtray. Yeah, that's all I need is this ashtray. And it's, it's just a classic, classic scene. This just, every time you watch, I watch it again over the weekend. It's just, this is hilarious, you know. All I need is this ashtray and this paddle game. And all I need is this ashtray and this paddle game and this remote control. And all I need is this ashtray, this paddle game, this remote control, and this lamp. Yeah, I need this lamp. And as he's leaving the house, he's, he's got to get, the, and this, you know. And he picks up the chair, and you see he's walking out of the house. His pants are down on his ankle, and it's like, you know, did they, did they script that? I bet they didn't script that. I bet that Martin just did that. But sometimes we just kind of get like that in life. We're just so easily, no, I don't need any of this stuff. Now I'm clean, All I, but this. Well, yeah, I need this, and then I need this. And the next thing you know, there we are, you know, and we're going flap, flap, steer, flap, flap, steer again. We're just, you know, going, going off on a tangent. There's a misunderstanding. I mean, I think we, for the most part, think that if we change some of the lesser things in life, that everything, you know, everything is less than our, our one true calling from God. And if we think that if we, we think that if we change these lesser things, that it's going to give us peace and it's going to find power. And we think that it ought to be easy, that there ought to be one thing. We try to simplify this. We think if we could just change this one thing, and, and we're always looking for that one thing, that simple fix. Well, we come to our Corinthian um, passage today. It's in the seventh chapter, and I'm, uh, I'm not going to do the whole, there's 40 verses here, so we're, we're not going to do all this. And uh, the Corinthians, uh, it's revealed that they have a question. And they've evidently written, written Paul. He's over at Ephesus. They have a question uh, about something. And um, he answers this. And he, uh, you know, the question that they've written evidently is, is it allowable for Christians to marry? And Christians that are married, should they be celibate? That's, that's what they ask him. Because that's what he, he answers. And now... You know, if you've read, if you've been with us for the previous two chapters, uh, this is kind of humorous, I think, because they're asking, should we be celibate? Remember, in the fifth chapter, we had the thing about the guy that's sleeping with his stepmother and all in the church are going, it's okay, it's all right, we're real proud of this, and Paul corrects them there. Then, then last week in the, in the sixth chapter, we had all that thing about sexual immorality and guys who were going to prostitutes and stuff, and he corrects them. We've got, that's some of the group in this church yeah, I mean, they got a guy going to prost some people going to prostitutes, some other people that are that are sleeping with their stepmothers, and everybody thinks it's great. And then we've got this other group, and this other group's going, We're married, but shouldn't we be celibate? And we go, Wow, how do these people get along? You talk about some diversity in a church on lifestyles. I mean, some people they think they can do anything, and the rest of them don't want to do anything, you know? And they they ask this question. And so we're, we're not reading um, that first section, but I just want to bring it to your attention that, that those of you that are married, you ought to go read this. I mean, it, it, it tells us some things about sexual relations, and as you know, I'm not afraid to talk about that like we did last week, but it tells us some things about our bodies and, and, and how we're supposed to function in a, in a marriage relationship. And, and then he teaches... Um, Followers of Christ who are married um, to those to someone else who isn't a Christian, and he tells them how to handle that. So, if that's your situation, you ought to go back there and read that. Well, the next section is uh, 17 through 24, and that's where I want to kind of um, spend our time today. And and I, Paul says something to me that's really shocking that that I, I don't expect him to say. He talks about status quo. And he says, 
stay as you are. Don't change anything. And, and we begin here at 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17 to 24. He says, uh, nevertheless, each person should live the kind of life that the Lord assigned when he called each one. This is what I teach in all the churches. If someone was circumcised when called, he shouldn't try to reverse it. If someone wasn't circumcised when he was called, he shouldn't be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. Not being circumcised is nothing. What matters is keeping God's commandments. Well, we know circumcision was for the males, the entrance into the old covenant, into the old Jewish covenant. And so he says, to don't, don't worry about that old right. Don't, don't worry about doing things like that in order to make you acceptable to God. You don't need to worry about that. Just leave it alone. You know, it didn't have the power back then to make you uh, really, you know, with God and understand. So it's nothing, just, it's just a distraction. So, so he's telling them, don't go off looking for things. One thing that you can do in order to make you right with God, just, just stay as you are, keep the status quo. And then verse 20, he goes on. He said, each person should stay in this situation they were in when they were called. So he repeats that same phrase again. If you were a slave when you were called, don't let it bother you. But if you are actually able to be free, take advantage of the opportunity. Anyone who was a slave when they were called by the Lord has the status of being the Lord's free person in the same way anyone who was a free person when they were called is Christ's slaves. slave. Then verse 23, he says, you were bought and paid for, don't become slaves of people. So then, brothers and sisters, each of you should stay with God in the situation you were in when you were called. So three times he gives us that status quo. Don't, you know, the way, the way you were when God called you, don't go messing with that. That's not that important. And he uses the example of slavery here uh, to teach, again, this principle, I think, of status quo. And, and I, I think that's really the principle that's over this whole chapter. Stay in the situation you were when you were called. It's not a very exciting message at first. And we stop and think about that, and we think, well, God's always wanting to change us in some way, and here he's saying, don't mess with that stuff. It's just not that important. But what he's telling him, he's saying, you know, being a slave isn't what's holding you back with God. That's, that's not what's it at all. Slavery, I mean, it's a very real situation in the Corinthians. Uh, in Corinth, there were a lot of slaves. In the Roman Empire, millions of slaves at that time. And, and we, we find from church history that the Christianity was, in the first and second centuries, a huge appeal to women and slaves. I mean, it, it grew. Uh, that, that was a large part of the church. That there were all different kinds of lifestyles and, and uh, social uh, strata, so to speak, in the church. But, but women and slaves, there are a lot of them in the church. And uh, the appeal wasn't because the early church was, you know, we need to get on the streets with some signs and liberate women and liberate slaves. And, you know, they're like our, when it, if we go with them and vote for the guy that's all against slavery and the guy that's all for women's rights. That wasn't the appeal at all. The, the appeal was that in Christ, as they lived into Christ, as their life was there, they were all the same. I mean, there was no social caste system in the church. There's some rich people, and there's some working people, and there's some not-so-rich people, and some slaves, and some free, and some males, and some females, and, and everything. But what they found was this new culture, this new community, where you know, that really hits with the title of our, our sermon series, you know, Community in One. That in, in Christ, didn't make any difference. They're all the same. So you could be a slave and, and come to the church community, come to that household, and it wasn't like anybody said, well, you know, you're just a slave, so you've got to sit in the back, or the church is going to be run by those of us that really know how to run things. So we got money, and we give more money, so we're going to run things. And that wasn't the case at all. But they just had this, this kind of family-type organization, family community, where, where everybody was the same because they were all in Christ. Galatians 3.28 uh, was another uh, word from Paul that says this. You're, you're familiar with this, I'm sure. Paul says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, just just cautionary word here. Don't, don't think that 
Paul is for slavery. He, he's not saying slavery is a good thing. That's, that's, he's just saying for you and, and, and your, your walk with Christ, it's, that's not the important thing, you see. Uh, as, as years go by, it's the church in every culture that fights slavery. It's the church in every culture that advances women, you see. But initially, he just says, just this isn't the most important thing. Just, just stay as you are. He says, there's, there's really no easy fix here. And we, you know, we hear all this and we go, no, wait a minute. You know, that's, this is all new to me. So you're saying, are you saying, Paul, then, that, that you know, my marriage isn't important? Are you saying that my family is not important? Are you saying that, you know, um, me getting my degree, me going back to school and working hard and better myself isn't, isn't important? Or, or are you telling me that my, my uh, physical program of dieting and losing weight, you tell me that that is important? You tell me that paying off my student loans is important? And he's, he's saying, no, all those things, good as they are, they're not the core of your life, you see? You fix those things, you're still not one with God. They may be very good things. Uh, God didn't call you because you're so smart. God didn't call you because you manage your money well. God didn't call you, you see, because your marriage is so great. God didn't call you because you come from a great family and you know how to do that. Th those things are good, but they are not the best. Over and over, Paul uses this word call, and I just kind of want us to shift a little bit and go over there for a while. Um, he uses that word call, called, or calling, some form of that word call, uh, 57 times in 1 Corinthians. I'd say that's a pattern, 57 times in this book. 192 times in his epistle letters, he uses call, called, or called. And, and what he means by that is urgently invited. You, are, you receive an urgent invitation when you receive a call from God. And it's like, okay, I don't think a call in that way. You know, you think, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call somebody. I'm going to leave a message. But it's not urgent invitation. I left a message on their phone. Or, you know, if it's a little bit more important, we might text them. And, you know, oh, the text means i got to respond to this right now. But... But we don't think as, as a call to someone to be an urgent invitation. And, uh, you know, the, the rest of this chapter, and we're not going to read that either, but the rest of this chapter, 25 to 40, really deals with the whole issue of urgent. And, um, you know, just briefly, uh, he tells them that if they, they aren't married, that they probably shouldn't get married because he says the time is short. In other words, Jesus is coming back any day. So if you get married, you're, you're going to have be kind of double-minded because you want to, you know, take care of family, and God might call you to go someplace. So, so it's urgent. You know, the time is short. Uh, Paul and the rest of the church thought he's coming back any day. The doors of the kingdom are going to close. We, we need to put every ounce of effort that we can to reach these people, all these, all these pagan people. And so he says, don't worry about it. You know, you probably shouldn't. If, if you have to, okay, that's all right. You can go ahead and get married, but realize it's easier for you probably if you're not married. And he says, if you've got property, you know, in the past, uh, don't, don't, just don't worry about the property. He says, because all that stuff's passing away. This is an urgent time, he's telling me. He says, well, family, well, he says, it's nice and good, but it might kind of hold you back. So you just feel this, you know, this talk, clock ticking in Paul's mind that the things are about done. And then he says all this stuff just might get in the way of what God wants to do. This, this is on verse 25 to 40. And he says the call is, is very, very important, this call of God. Now, I hope that you've heard that call. If your life's really a mess and you're looking, then, then maybe I'm hoping that you haven't heard that call and you're hearing it right now. But, you know, I've hoped that you've heard that urgent call on your life. Um, nothing else, you see, really matters in the Bible or in any other thing about God if you haven't heard that, that urgent call. And, and I can't make it to you. Only, only God and His Holy Spirit can make that urgent call to you. He's the only one that can really reach into you and, and speak to you. And, you know, to go on with this just a little bit more, uh, 
favorite passage of many in the Bible is Roman, Romans 8, 28 to 29. And, um, you know, here's a verse that almost everybody knows. We know that God works all things together for good for the ones who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. And most of us memorize that sometime because when life's going bad, we go, well, this is going to work out because I love God and I feel called according to his purposes. This is going to work out. But the, but the next verse, verse 29, we don't read that so much. He says, we know this because God knew them in advance and he decided in advance that they would be conformed to the image of his son. And that way his son would be the first of many brothers and sisters. See? Verse 28 says you're called with a purpose. The 29 says the purpose is is that you would be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, the whole reference there to image, you know, that might be a little vague to us. So, so let me fill in a few blanks here too. It's, where he's going back to is Genesis 1, 26 and 27. God says, let us make man in our image. Verse 27, male and female, he created them in his image, right? And so we have this teaching that human beings are, are, are made in the image of God. And we usually think, well, that means that we've got a soul and we've got a spirit, and that's what that means. And there's a whole other dimension to this that I, I think that, that is behind every time that they use the word image in the Bible. You know, in ancient cultures, um, the time when you know, Moses would have written this, in ancient cultures, uh, a city would often erect uh, a non-Yahweh, a non-Hebrew city, would erect a huge statue either in the middle of the city or sometimes outside the gate of the city. And this would be a huge statue of stone or wood, and it would be this ominous-looking God. I mean, just this mean, nasty-looking God. And this was the image of their God. And they were saying, if you mess with us, this image, this God is going to get you. You don't want to mess with this town because this is our God. And doesn't he look mean? Doesn't he look strong and powerful? So that was the image of the God. And I think what God is saying here, even in Genesis 1, is that he says, I'm going to make you in my image. Human beings are going to represent me. Where you go on the earth, people are going to look at you and know who I am. See, you're, you're going you're gonna to be my kind of little God images. They're going to go out. And, of course, in the fall when they ate from the tree, all that was kind of ruined. But it's restored in Jesus Christ. You see? He is the image of the invisible God. He has made him known to us. And then he tells us that, that you're going to be conformed to this image. You're going to look like Jesus. So when people see you, they are going to know of the greatness of God. And that's, that's your calling, that you're going to be conformed to this image. And then he goes on, he says, and that way his son would be the first of many brothers and sisters. Isn't that nice? I've always wanted an older brother. Never, you know, had an older sister. You know how that goes. I always wanted an older brother, right? Did you, those of you that don't have older brothers, wouldn't it have been nice to have an older brother just to pick on you and to fight for you, right? You know, pick up for you in third grade when the bullies got you. I always wanted an older brother. Did you ever think of Jesus as your brother? That's, you know, we think of him as uh, Lord and Savior and Healer and Master and King and, and all these different things, but do we think of him as brother? Now, this being kind of a, a family, kind of a household situation of, of Jesus, Jesus being our, our older brother. Um, it's an urgent invitation. This is the calling. I want you to be in my family, God is saying. Here's my call to you. I want you to be in my family. I want you to join my family. And I want you to look like the oldest son, just like Jesus. See, he represents the Father. And where you go, others are going to recognize you. You're going to be formed in his image. When you go out, people are going to say, well, you know, there must be a God because I, I know him and uh, I know her. We love this. I, I think most of us are ready to hear, you know, 
the, the call more confirmed in our life and the idea of family and the idea of God calling us, urge, ur urgently inviting us into his family and, the, you know, to, to join this family. There, there's no entrance exam. There's no DNA test. You know, anybody can get in. You, you're called and you all get into this family. It's a great invitation, I think, and he wants me. I, you know, there's nothing I got to do. There's nothing I got to change to get into this family. It's all been done by Jesus and he wants me to be formed in his image, and he wants me to be in this family with Jesus as my older brother. And then at the same time, it's, I think it's kind of confusing. I mean, um, I don't know how to do this. Um, we hear people today, and, and have for some time, talk and, and use this, and I use, I use this expression all the time, and, and yet, I know it's confusing to some people. We talk about people being in a relationship with God. What does that actually mean? I mean, some of us aren't very good at relationships with each other. What, what does it mean to be in a relationship with God? I mean, we can't see him. We can't, you know, hear his voice. Um, there, there's always some ambiguity about everything that we think that he's saying. We're not, just not certain about everything. It's, I mean, it's just challenging. And I, I mean, we, we hear the call and you know, I think, man, I'm going to mess this up somehow. You know, if you leave it up to me, I'm going to mess this up because there's, there just doesn't seem to be any certainty here. And, and sometimes we pray and, and, you know, if you're like me, you pray and you pray and you don't hear anything. And somebody else prays and they go, oh, Lord told me this, and Lord told me that. And we go, wow, I, th I think he really did. I think he really did tell her that. But, but I pray and, you know, my antenna just maybe aren't that active. You know, maybe, maybe I need a little booster on my antenna or something because sometimes I just don't hear everything that's God, that God is saying. We think, you know, how's this going to work out? Fighting and challenging. As well, I, th I think I heard God, but because he wants me in, in his family, you know, I'm not sure because I'm not really sure that I'm ready to be in that family. That just sounds like a big step to me for God to say, I want you to be in my family. And it's, it's kind of like, you know, I've been play, playing seventh grade football and all of a sudden varsity wants me to start next week. And it's kind of like, I'm not sure I'm ready for this. I'm not sure I can do this. So it's just, uh, it's inviting and challenging at the same time. First Corinthians 7, I don't think it really has a lot to do with marriage. I don't think it has a lot to do with slavery. I don't think it has a lot to do uh, with sex. It's, it's really God's call to us, you know, and that's what he's trying to remind them of. And they're saying, can we do these things, and would it be all right, and what should we do with this with this? And he gives them some advice, but he says, that's not really what this is a, a, about. He said, he says, it's God's call on you. And I think we dance, you know, around this a lot. We, we have lessons and groups and we have things at, at church. And, and sometimes I think, you know, friends, I think God really says, so what? So, so you're doing all this stuff, so what? Well, what about you and me? You know? Um, yeah, you're having studies and you're having groups and you're praying and you're doing mission stuff and, and that's great. But, but what about you and me? I mean, how long has it been since it's just you and him? It's just, just you and the Father. And we say, hey, you know, what do you want me to do? Isn't there one thing that I can do to fix this? Isn't there one thing, you know, that will just make everything right? And I think God says more than anything else. He's just saying, would you listen to me? Well, would you just spend some time with me? I mean, we do a lot of horizontal, what I'd call horizontal stuff, and, and we're big on community here. But in community, it, it should never be neglected. But really, as mutually important, is the vertical relationship that we have with God, with God the Father. And, and we have to be connected there. We have to be listening. I mean, I think, I think God desperately calls us back to that. He's just saying... Would you let me be a father to you? Would you, would you let me talk to you? Let, just let me bring you into the family. We, could we just sit together for a while? It's not like any family that you've ever been in. So, what do you think about that today? Okay? Where's, where's God speaking to you on, on that issue of uh, your vertical connection with him? 
Um, not the things you go to, not the things you do, but your, your vertical connection with him. I mean, has it been a while? Is it uh, something you really struggle with, like some of us do? You know, is it, is it easier to talk about him than it is to talk to him? Let's, let's sit with that for just a little bit. As deep cries out 